everybody, it's Romania Black. Wow, so we're on volumes 13 and 14 of Seraph of the End, and so I broke down, I said in the last video I wasn't sure what I was going to do about the whole Gurren Ichinose catastrophe at 16. I did a little research about it, and there is a manga adaptation. The story originally started out as seven light novels, and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I guess the light novels were actually created before the work on the manga that we are currently reading even began. So I was like, okay, cool. So this is not only a prequel series, but the original series the author was working on. And I'm going to say author instead of mangaka because there are two people that work on this series. There is an actual author and there's someone else who does the artwork who is the mangaka. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So the author had worked on these light novels of Gurren Ishinose first and then started on Seraph of the End, making it the sequel that happened eight years later. And I was like, okay. So I was going to react to the manga, but then I couldn't find an official English adaptation. And I was like, I don't know. And so then I was like, am I going to do like a manga adaptation reaction of Gurren's thing alongside the one that I'm doing? And so instead I finally, um, I talked to Discord to some people about it and they were like, well, the novels, the light novels have been translated into English. And I was like, oh, because usually light novels are not translated into English from anime. It is few and far between. Uh, it's getting more popular, but it's hard to find good light novels that have been adapted. So I found out that there are four English translation versions of the Gurren Ichinose novels. Um, the seven novels in Japan have been adapted into four English versions. Um, there's one that has volume parts one and part two, three and four, five and six, and then the seventh part is its own light novel. So um, thank you, Patreon, because y'all helped me buy the four novels. So I've, I've read the first one over oh, the last two days. I haven't been able to put it down. I started reading it yesterday and was just like, oh my gosh, because there's just so much. And I originally when I got halfway done with this novel, I was like, oh, I'll talk about it at the beginning before starting volumes 13 and 14. And I have like five pages of notes on this one alone. <laughs> so I've decided that I'm going to keep reading the novels as I'm reading Seraph of the End with you all. And I'm going to do my own separate video to just talk about the novels because there is a lot in these novels. They're great. <laughs> if you get a chance to get the, the, if you are a Seraph of the End fan and you want the Gurren Ichinose light novel, it's great. There's some illustrations in it. It's really cool seeing the story from Gurren's perspective. It's helping me to understand his character more. Um, these demons are terrifying. And yeah, <laughs> this is kind of a problem. So what I figured I would do is I've only read the first novel. Hopefully my goal is to have the second novel read by the time I react to volumes uh, 15 and 16, which are going to be the next ones next week. So that's my goal. And then, like I said, once I have all four of the light novels read that I have, I'm going to do a video about it. I know there's also like a resurrection at age 19 set, which I'm assuming is referring to as Farad talked to us in the last uh, volume about Gurren's squad getting killed and them getting resurrected. So I'm assuming there's going to be something about that. But I'll, I'll check into that once I finish this first set of four and see what, what I'll do there. But um, but yeah, so basically what I'm going to do is um, I was feeling a little bit bad because I was like, well, do I need to read all four novels before I start volumes 13 and 14 because they're going to be flashing back? I'm like, do I need to read the manga and just not do the novels? And then the mangaka at the end of novel one in part one has like a little afterward. And the author himself says, well, you don't have to read these novels to understand what's going on in the manga. And you don't have to read the manga to enjoy the light novels. And so I was like, okay, so it's just supplement at this point. So what I'll do is as we're going through volumes 13 and 14, I may reference what I know from book one. Now in the comments below, please do not spoil me what's going to happen in the other books because I'm about to read them. I don't want to be spoiled. So don't spoil me about the other novels. Please don't. No hints, no stuffing. I'm, I'm going to read them. Um, but I am going to reference book one uh, th uh, throughout this. And then as I go and read the other books, I'll probably bring those references back up. And when I do my video over all four books, I will probably touch base on the manga and what we've read so far and talk about it as well. So... That's my long-winded intro for this video, but I'm really excited. Um, if you do get a chance to get the English copies, they're, they're really nice. The binding's on there. They got some color pages. Uh, it's, it's a really, it's a nice quality translation, too. I'm really happy about it. Um, Gurren is a very interesting protagonist. He's a lot, what I appreciate is he is a lot different than you. 
a lot different than you. And Shinya is even different younger too. He's interesting in this. But I appreciate that Gurren is not a car- you is not a carbon copy of Gurren. They are different. And I like that a lot. And <laughs> Shinoa is not a carbon copy of Maharu. Mm -mm, Maharu, she's a trip. Demon Maharu. We haven't really seen in the novel the real Maharu. We've seen the demon version of her and she's quite frightful. So yeah. But I'm excited to see when we last left off in the manga at chapter 47, when we left off, um, Yu's demon is getting stronger. It's, it's taking over him more and more each day, which this novel makes that whole possession thing terrifying. It's a lot darker in the novel than it has been in the series so far, uh, at least for Gurren. And so it's pretty terrifying that it's, it's in possessing him more and more. Farid's like, oh, let's just go and talk about Seraph at the end and learn all the backstory. Hop from my sports car to this bus. I got your friend's head in a jar. Going to do some experimental stuff that we probably shouldn't do, but let's talk about it. And it's, it's a lot, but I'm, I'm here for it. Last couple of vol uh, volumes 11 and 12 were bonkers. And I have a feeling that that was only the beginning. So... I don't know. I'm really excited. Uh, as I'm recording this, the season finale is aired on uh, on YouTube and the reactions to volumes 11 and 12 is aired on Patreon. So I'm pretty excited about that. But let's not waste any more time. I've talked enough in this intro. Uh, let's dive right in and just see what happens. So we are going to be reviewing today uh, volumes 13 and 14 of Seraph of the End, chapters 48 through 55. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one one and let's go oh <laughs> there's so much that happens in this manga i'm like floored at how much has just been like poof just come to the surface i i honestly am glad i had been really worried going into these two volumes that that I would need to read all of this. It was going to spoil this. That's what I was worried about. I was worried that reading the manga was going to spoil the novel. And it doesn't really. I There's still stuff the novel hasn't touched on that's not being shown here. So that's good. That makes me happy that, okay, I can keep reading this. And I'm not being spoiled. Because we knew from the manga in, in volume 12 that they all died. So that's not spoiling me in this. But they gave us that little glimpse of Gurren activating the resurrection of his friends for reasons, and I'm sure reading the novel will find all that out. But some things on the timeline, it's like, okay, interesting. I thought about bringing White Boar Coon out because there's parts of this that I'm like, we might need to talk about and kind of break things down, especially with the progenitors and the characters. There's the, the character of Saito or Rigor. He's in this, and we need to talk about him um, briefly. Like I said, I'm going to make a video about the novels, but we're going to talk about him. So I may actually do that. We, we may bring White Boar Coon out just to kind of break down these two volumes because there's a lot going on. It feels so weird bringing White Boar Coon out for Seraph at the end, but this is White Boar Coon. He is my helper in explaining all things, and I'm glad that I get to bring him out for Seraph at the end because there's a, there's a freaking lot that happened in these two volumes. I'm... For the record, I'm glad I'm reading two volumes at once because I feel like they, they feed into each other pretty well. But man, oh, there were some also pa awesome panels. The panel of Gurren with, with Mahru in his lap, like with him all the time. Oh my God, like just don't even. His relationship with Mahru is very interesting and I feel like we only get a little dab of it in this first volume. So as I keep reading... Um, I'm probably going to have more to say about that as we go, but it's interesting. So I'm going to probably touch upon some things from the first novel, the first two books um, that I've read as we go through this. But can I say for the record, I love Crowley. <laughs> Crowley and Farad may have become two of my favorites. Uh, Farad is just ridiculous. And we're seeing like there's, it's so bizarre because Mika is afraid that he's losing his humanity, but there's still some emotion there there's something under the surface. It's the weirdest thing. Farid is just like, Farid is just throwing on this eccentric, na eccentric nature just to hide the fact that he's pretty empty inside. But Crowley, Crowley grew on me in this. I was like, especially when he's like, Farid's giving me friends. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Crowley may be one of my favorites. I kind of love him. He's a little cinnamon bun, even though he's a mass murderer from the crusade, which we'll talk about that. That's interesting that he's from the crusades. Okay. So we're, we're going to break a lot of stuff down in this and talk about this. We have this whole bathroom scene with them 
and them debating on what to do and talking about Yoichi and everything. Uh-huh. So this whole thing, I, I get why Mika is like, I'm with Mika on this. Bringing people back from the dead, not a good idea. You shouldn't tamper with that. That's not what's done is done. And I don't think the thing of it is, is that they don't know that the people only come back for 10 years and then it's it's so bizarre though because there's a connection there's actually several connections to attack on titan with this series and i didn't think i'd ever be mentioning attack on titan with with this but i am so i in the comments down below if you have watched attack on titan and you know what i'm talking about there is and i don't want to spoil anything for attack on titan if you've not seen that series because it's a very different series than this. But some of the thematic elements of these two volumes are brought up in Attack on Titan. And I'm like, okay, we're bringing these things up. But in that series, there is a character that is essentially brought back from the dead. And it's for a limited time. And it's there's some ethical, there's ramifications with that. But, but the person makes that choice, right? So there was a connection there. I was like, wow, wow, we're really getting into that. But... It's really, yeah, and so there's a conversation happening in the bathroom, and when Narumi says there's hardly anyone who hasn't lost a loved one, and Mika is slowly losing his humanity, he's like, bring somebody back to life, most humans would do almost anything, and Mika's like, but that's still not right, and I'm kind of with Mika, I've watched Full Metal Alchemist, I've seen enough stories to know that nope, we don't do that, <laughs> so, so essentially with the whole resurrection thing, with the resurrection, there is a caveat that, yes, you can bring someone back. You can bring someone back, but they are only back for 10 years, supposedly. And it will unleash a deadly virus. Okay. Now, the question is, it would make sense if they were all brought back and that's why the virus didn't affect them. But I guess that some people weren't affected by the virus. If you got that vaccine, they talked about that in the previous manga. And I'm sure the Haragi family got, got that vaccine. If you read the first novel, they go into a lot of detail about the Haragi clan and the Ichinose are kind of like a smaller branch with that. And the fact that the Haragi clan, they've kind of become the leaders of this occult group that for a thousand years have been like fighting vampires behind the scenes and like delving into dark magic and it's like a dark Hogwarts sort of thing. And so they were prepared for this sort of thing. But then there was this other organization called the Thousand Knights in the novel that is where Saito is from. Saito's from the Thousand Knights. He was the leader of that group or someone that worked higher up in that. And they were the ones doing the experiments on the Hakuya sect, which was the orphanage where Mika and you were from. So Saito's connected to all of those, which are connected to Farid, which is connected to Cruel. It's all a big chain. We'll do the family tree of vampires over here. But that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. So essentially, basically, what happens is when humans break one of these taboos, there is an angel that's sent to destroy them. And so the humans and vampire, the humans are trying to control those angels. So Kimizuki's like, is my sister becoming one of these things? Not happy about it. So... Interesting. And I love I love that Shinoa is just trying to break the break the, the tension where she's like, how do you use a urinal? And the guys are like, we're having this conversation now. Why? And so Farid, Farid saying that, of course I'm not taking them to where, where they did the sacrifice. No, 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 no. We're going to Osaka Bay to rendezvous with Gurren. So he wasn't lying. Farid did take them to his mansion. That's where they were going to rendezvous with Gurren. Not at the bus stop, but at, at the mansion. So he wasn't lying with that. Ooh, this, this is going to get interesting. I'm curious to know if Gurren, that's going to be the thing. If Gurren is going to be the one to have the talk with you to be like, no, don't bring them back. We don't want to do that. Like him saying, no, you don't understand. Because Gurren, I, how is Gurren going to tell them about but oh here's the thing they they said if, if the dead find out they've been brought back to life they'll turn back to dust so is you and them gonna blab and shinya and them turn back to dust no that's awful no 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 oh that would be awful oh shit so they're gonna have to find a way to not say anything 
And Gurren's going to be like, look, nope, don't say a word. Oh, my God, that's going to be a massacre. Oh, shit. I hadn't even thought about that if, if they say anything. Oh, now I want to read the next volume. Now I want to read the next set of volumes. Oh, no. But uh, I kind of want to wait till I've read one more book before I read the next set, though. Ugh. So Les Carr, let's talk about him. Les Carr, we get this whole family of vampires and whatever the, the first progenitor. And they've got like, they've got Cruel stuck in the wall where she can't go. And they're just dangling. Oh, uh, they're just dangling bodies above her, just dripping blood. Ugh. And they're chains. So Saito's big thing in the novel is that he attacks with chains. And I thought it was like a demon ability. It's kind of. He's he's not a vampire anymore. He's kind of like a demon. It's it's weird. Saito is weird. But let's talk about this. So we have this first... The first progenitor. Okay. Whoever he is. And we have Erd. And we have Saito. All right. And they were the seconds... Now we also have a cruel who is the third. And then over here we have Ashura, who's a Jiramaru. Okay, so Ashura has become a Jiramaru, which is now with you. Funny that. So he's inside you trying to take him over. That's why Cruel's so interested in you because I don't know, is does Cruel realize that at, that you have, she may not realize that you has a Juramaru inside of him. She may not realize that, but once she finds out, she's gonna be real interested in him because that's basically her brother. Mm. They had the same last name and everything. Ha. Huh. And so they drip the bodies below, above them, basically to keep her alive. So, okay. We have Erd here, and there was Saito. We see him, and we see Azura and Cruel, and the brother and sister with the first progenitor. Uh-huh, and Saito. She says Saito's changed. He's dyed his hair, and he looks different. His ears aren't, his ears aren't pointy anymore either. So he's, like, modified himself. Saito is creepy. Saito is a very disturbing character in this series because there's clearly something that's been tampered with and he's like messed with himself and he's not really like, he didn't bleed when they cut his arm off. Something's not right. Like he's like a husk. It's that's like the creepiness. I don't like it, but okay. So we have you, uh, is now I'm going to make that center cause it's going to bother me. So you is the one that has a Jiramaru inside of him. Mm. And so Saito, he, turned two people and then cruel oddly enough is the one that turned Mika so isn't that so it's funny the sisters the sister and brother turned she turned uh Mika technically but Mika was completed by you who had as your Amaru in him so it's like hmm keeping it in the family <laughs> but we have a Crowley we find out Crowley and Farid they're more like brothers even though even though Farid got him to become a vampire, he didn't drink Farid's blood. He drank Saito's. Okay. And then Crowley, as far as we know, turned chess and horn. So there's lots of talk in this series about uh, fathers and sons and brothers and like family, like how, how they create this family and what ends up happening with it. So that's interesting. But yeah, Saito, he's freaky. I don't I don't trust Saito. I don't like him. In the book, he's kind of freaky too. In the book, he doesn't seem that strong. In the book, he just seems like he's a nuisance. Like he's an assassin and he tries to kill Gurren in the, in the first novel. But Gurren manages to out... He clearly was holding back a lot. So I'm like, hmm, interesting. And he's fair... And so it makes sense he was working for the Thousand Knights. In the novel, they attack a, um, a Four Horsemen of John and they try to take a piece of it back as a sample and Maharu gets part of it and for the Thousand Nights. And then um, Farid comes in to try to take the other half, which would make sense if he knows Saito. Is it coincidence? Is it, I don't know. But yeah. So, and then Cruel is mad because he takes, 
he takes Ashura away to become a demon. Mm, and we don't get to see his face. And he says, this is for our future. I have to go now. And Cruel's so sad that she's left alone without of him, without him. So, mm, we'll call you Azura Maru. And so then he got trapped inside the sword that you has. Okay. And you's made a contract with him. Interesting. So the vampires can become demons. We've established that. But they specifically have become demons that have been trapped in the swords and made contract with the humans. So that's interesting. It's kind of like a, like a chimera ant merging between you and them. It's funny, right? Hmm. And so, yeah. So then Erd shows up. Erd is an interesting character. Erd is all... It's funny. It's, it's, Erd is very no nonsense. Erd's like, I'm not here to play games, right? And I don't like Saito's smile, like Saito's creepy smile. No, 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 no. So then we have, uh, we have our other vampires over here. I don't know if Lest Car is one created by Erd. Maybe I'm going to put like a little question mark here. Maybe he was created by Erd. I don't remember if they said that or not. And then we have the fifth progenitor, right? I call him Saito, but his name is Rigger. Rigger Stafford. Hmm. I also love the idea that, um, I also love the idea that, that Crowley slams on the brakes to knock Farad through the window of the bus. It's great. And then he breaks his neck and snaps it back. It's wonderful. But in that moment, Farad saying, once again, the sky is such a beautiful blue. It's absolutely boring. Yeah, like he he just wants, he's just tired of this existence and being alive for so many years and he just wants to change things up. So it makes sense why he's just trolling everybody. He's like, I'm immortal. I've got nothing else to do. So might as well make this fun. And Crowley is just like, I don't know. But yeah, so Les Carr and all them show up. And then we go to chapter 50. These chapters are really long. Like there's, there's a lot of long chapters in this. Brothers in Blood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that picture of Saito or Rigor with the chains is really interesting. I like they use that. So, okay. So we got this little world building here where Les Carr, he took, he took the heart out of Farid. So basically, if you take, take away the heart, then the vampire becomes a demon, which is essentially what's happened to Azura, to Ashura. All right. And kind of essentially when humans become demons in this world, that's exactly what happens to them. They lose their heart. It's just the demon takes it over. And that's so fascinating because it's interesting that it's a demon taking over the heart of a human, almost like they're trying to get that heart back. It's been taken from them and they're trying to reclaim it. And it just ends up, it just doesn't work and it consumes them into this thing. The book describes when Gurren takes the sword and uh, Maharu's sword, whatever demons possessed Maharu, when he takes the sword, it is not happy go fun times like it is. This, this manga and this anime so far has made it seem like happy fun times compared to the book. No, the book, as soon as he touches the sword, the sword's like, don't you want to kill all your friends? Don't you want to like rape them and assault them and destroy them and burn them alive and rip their flesh apart? And it's like, whoa, like within the first five seconds. And it's terrifying. The book makes it so chilling just how much. And then it's like so graphic and intense right from the start. And then when Gurren like snaps out of it, the demon's still like, well, I've already tainted your heart. So it's over. It doesn't matter. It's like, it's too late. Like you can't go back. Once you once you form this contract with the demon, it's over. And um, I'll get to it in the book, but there's like a passage that describes it. And it's like the heart festering, like your soul festering with this hatred. And in the center of that hatred, a demon sprouts. And just like it's there. It's The description of it's very chilling. But that makes me very sad and terrified because now it's like all of them there have that demon sprouted in them. So it's already taking over them, whether they like it or not. Right? And so it's, God, it's terrifying, right? And so Farad instantly, I feel bad for Kimizuki in this. Kimizuki's had his sister taken from him. She's been turned into this monster. Farad, once he gets out of Les Carr, once he gets his heart put back in, the first thing he does is suck Kimizuki's blood. He doesn't kill some Kimizuki. I think that's important to note. He did not kill Kimizuki. He left him alive. Um, but yeah, it's intense 
how quickly Erd realizes that that Cruel is there and from so far away, and they on the other side of of Osaka realize that he's there. It's insane. It's like, oh, okay. And Azura and uh, Cruel, she since she's a vampire, she has an age, so she's still like she has a maturity to her, but she's still like in the body of a little kid, right? Um, but Saito realizes that she's got this ointment that's keeping her neck open and they've smelled her blood. And so he licks the ointment off. It's like, ugh. And, but it's too late. Erd's already found her. And like, he's just there. He's just there. And he slices off his arm and he's like, oh. And the chain, it's just like, the chains are coming from inside of him. Ugh. It's pretty freaky stuff with Saito, with rigor or whatever. However you want to call him. And then Erd ends up taking Cruel back with him. I like that, like, Le I like that Les, he gets his body cut in half and he drags himself back to the body and, like, stitches it back together. Uh, it's, ugh. So that does beg the question of the first vampire. Like, where did he come from? How did it start? What are the rules? I'm assuming we'll find out eventually. It's interesting, like, where uh, where this all started. But Farid seeing Saito, seeing Rigor, and being like, oh, do you still want to kill me? Like, ah, da, da, da. like, Archie, what are you going to do? And he's just expecting Saito to fight him. And instead he gets a head pat. And he's like, I certainly chose an odd one to turn into a vampire. Like, it, it's like Farad almost wants to die, but he's too, he doesn't. So he's like, I don't want to. He's like, I'm bored of this existence, but he's like, I don't want to die. But at the same time, he's like, uh. But that, that head pat, oh, I almost want to take a picture of that because it's, it's very unusual to see Farid seem kind of off his game. And he definitely does in this. So, oh, it is a creepy, Saito's just creepy. So, yeah. So, they're back on the bus. They're trying to figure out what to do. And we get the whole thing with Yoichi of Yoichi seeing uh Lacus, seeing Lucas uh and Renee the ones that killed his sister mm. Lacus and like his demon so his demon looks freaking badass Yoichi's we didn't get to see him in the original anime we got to see him being taken over and he had the little horns poking out but we never got to see him his demon his demon's like a badass like what the hell Gecko in. Like, he's got this, like, he looks like Ichigo off of Bleach, and he has, like, the horns and the leather and everything, and we know now why the, why the demons look like vampires, because they were vampires that were turned into demons. So, that all makes sense. So, this guy was once a vampire, too. And he's got, like, the stuff over his eye and everything. Oh, uh, so the question, so the question is, though, Yoichi, we'll put him over here. Yoichi, it's funny because Mika talks about, we have a lot of talk about humanity and what that means to different people. So we have Yoichi who believes he's putting on a front of being nice. The nice guy thing is a front. Now, I, I am questioning that a little bit because he does the creepy smile. He does the creepy Saito smile. Like on there, he's like, this is completely different. I like the demons like, look, if you're not comfortable, he's like, these people are using you. Like, like Gekuin's just kind of like saying, hey, these people are using you. Like he's just trying to put up, you know, explain what's going on. And Yoichi, he's like, you Yuchiro is a nice person. I'm not nice at all. I'm mean and nasty and petty and I can't let the others ever find out. So this whole time, according to Yoichi, him being kind is an act. It's all a game. He's like, I'm not really nice. Mm -mm. He's like, I'm not nice at all. He asks Gecko and he says, when it finally is time to kill Lachis, we're not going to do it quickly. We're going to do it slowly and make him suffer. So he regrets ever being born. Oh my God. And see, the thing of it is, in the novel, in the novel, when the demon first starts to take over Gurren, it starts to tell Gurren to do all these nasty things, 
and it tries to like entice Gurren and lure it very seductively. But here, the demon's sitting there listening to Yoichi, and the demon's like, oh, okay, cool. That's glad I got paired up with you. So those are actually Yoichi's thoughts. Yoichi, he's just, it's a front of him being nice, and he wants to torture Lacus for killing his sister. And that kind of relates back to what Crowley tries to tell you in the mansion. He's like, dude, humans have been killing humans all along. He's like, they're the worst at it. It's like, we haven't, he's like, since I've become a vampire, I haven't killed that many people at all. It's just, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> you know, humans have that capability. And I don't know if the mangaka is trying to just make a statement about that. But the fact that, because the whole time I was like, you've been, uh, like, Yoichi's been such a cinnamon bun. I'm like, Yoichi's been so sugar sweet. And when you find out it's just a front, that he's actually not like that, but he doesn't want his friends to know because they got this perception of him. Hmm. But then he finds out about the torture method. And I'm pretty sure he wants to find a way to destroy the ring that they wear. That, that was a world building thing. The ring that they wear that keeps them from burning alive in the sunlight. He wants to destroy it and torture Lacus. Okay. Interesting. I love that Les Carr is pulling Farid by the po by the ponytail up to drag him up to the spot there. It's ridiculous. And Farid's like, could you please not do that, sir? And then Les just, Farid, he gets a beating from Les Carr. He really does. So the vampires have this ring. They have this ring that keeps them from burning alive in the sun. That keeps them safe from the sunlight. Interesting. Because I wondered about that. I wondered if we have any like vampire conventions. Like they've been out in the sunlight. But it's really because of that ring. And they get like everything. They get of course crucified because symbolism. But here's the thing. Cruel sees. She sees you and Ajuramaru kind of flares up a little bit. Right? Like they see each other and there's this connection. And you instantly goes to Ajuramaru. Who... Look, has like the long flowy hair and looks a little bit different, right? But I love this conversation because you was like, is something wrong? He's like, I think I'm feeling your emotions. And you and the demon, Ajuramar is like, demons aren't supposed to have emotions. And he's like, well, what is it then? And he says, I don't know. It is emotions. That That's the thing. That's the thing is that we talk about um, humanity and we have humanity and we have vampires and we have demons. And so with humanity, there is this intense, there is an intense sense of love, but there's also pride and hatred and the capacity to kill. And the demons are not supposed to have emotions. Right? They're not supposed to have emotions. But they sure do feed off of their host. They're parasitic. So we'll say that they're parasitic. And they're supposed to feed off of hatred and desires to take over its host. And I'm assuming that can apply to both vampires and humans. It just consumes and takes it over eventually. And then vampires, they have faded uh, emotions, supposedly. And humanity. And that was really sad when when you's like when Mika's like, I'm I'm slowly like, he's like, I've noticed since I've become a vampire, I'm just kind of caring less and less about I'm having less empathy towards everything. And he's just like, I'm slowly fading. And then Narumi, Narumi tries to get the heart. He was like, well, do you still like you or not? And he's like, I don't feel any different about you. So I guess I do. And so Narumi's trying to get to the bottom of it, saying, okay, then it is possible for vampires to maintain some semblance of humanity as long as they have that, that semblance with them, that shred of humanity left. So that's really sad. I don't want Mika to lose his humanity. I don't want Mika to like not care. That's really sad. And then I'm glad that Ajuramaru inside of you is having like some kind of feelings erupting there. I feel like that's interesting. 
But yeah, the this guy here, the fifth progenitor, he's pretty terrifying. All right. And then that's when Yoichi sees the exposure torture. And of course, he's like, we're going to rescue them. Of course he is. So meanwhile, we have Credo, who's been talking to his demon, which is scary this whole time. Just talking to them. Ugh. And they're going to take control of Shibuya. Meanwhile, Gurren has the squad back. It's crazy. So you find out in the novel, uh, the first novel just tells how Gurren, this is, this takes place like, this is where the timeline gets weird, right? Because this takes place uh, roughly, probably eight years before, eight years before, uh, before the events of the main story. So this is weird, right? So it takes place, uh, Gurren, the Gurren novels are eight years before a Seraph of the End. Okay, when Gurren is 16 and in the current storyline he's 24. So it is eight years before. Okay, so this and this by the end of the point where we are at the manga it's been roughly a year since the start of that. So then so then Shinya and crew And in the novel, they do say that the Seraph, that the big apocalypse is going to happen on Christmas. So I guess that came, I guess that happened. I haven't gotten that in the novel yet. So they died and were brought back. But it's been nine years. So they only have a year left. So, so Gurren's on a time clock for some reason. Something, he's on a time clock for something. The question is what? Why is he on a time clock? What's he trying to work for? We don't know. But, of course, that's the end of volume 13. So then we have volume 14. I love volume 14. It's probably one of my favorites so far of them going to the mansion. So they go to the mansion. They fight this noble. Mika's like, I don't trust any of these vampires. And he doesn't trust them because he slowly believes he's starting to become like them. And he's like, I don't trust myself. I don't trust them. We, sh we need to be careful about this. And I love the conversation that I, I don't agree with Narumi though. Narumi's like all of humanity's bottomless, ugly, all consuming greed, all it ever births. And Narumi says hope and Mika says despair. So yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I'm an optimist. I'm all for humanity. I think that we can, we can get it right if we try, but I draw a fine line at bringing back the dead. I'm like in no story have I ever read that that's gone well. <laughs> That that's been all peach keen, no repercussions whatsoever. Um, and I so I don't agree entirely with Mika that it's just despair that's brought from humanity, but I don't agree with Narumi that it's hope. I'm like, I think both of you kind of need to be somewhere more in the middle, right? And he's like, I'm uneasy. And then that's when this vampire shows up and Crowley just kills him. Crowley's like, I, we're in the middle of something, so if you could just die, that'd be great. And he's like, oh, hey, guys. And then he stabs him and that's, and that's that. So I, he tests all of them and reveals that he's not really a 13th progenitor. He's actually like more like a seventh. He's on the same level as, as Farad. They're brothers. They're brothers in blood, brothers in arms. Mm -hmm. And so then of course you is still on about, we're going to rescue him. We're going to save our friends. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the guy, the fifth progenitor, he's a weirdo. <laughs> Because I love it. He's like, what's going on? Did you say something? Like, he's almost like a, I don't know what he's like, but he's so strange. And so they talk about this whole thing of predators and prey, right? And so Narumi and Mika have this big conversation about how humans and vampires are. And Narumi's like, look, this is what we know about vampires. We've been taught this since day one, but here you are. You're kind of a, a exception to the rule, right? So maybe we can get along with vampires. And he's like, you are human, right? And so he tests Mika and tries to get him to drink his blood. But Mika, of course, doesn't do it. And Kimizuki's like, I don't like this. Let's not tease him. And Yoichi makes the comment. He's like, if they haven't killed any of our family, I don't see why we can't be nice to each other. And Yoichi, now that we know that he's kind of putting up a front himself... That kind of makes more sense. But I'm like, yeah, Yoichi's like, if they're not hurting us, why can't we get along? And I don't like that 
Mika's saying that his humanity is vanishing. I don't like that. And he's like, I haven't been a vampire until recently. And he's like, yeah, it's becoming shorter. So yeah, just like, just like you is being possessed by a demon, Mika is losing his humanity. And I don't like that. He's like, my emotions are atrophying. He's like, he's becoming more emotionless and apathetic. Ugh. I don't, I don't like it. No. Mm -mm. I don't like the fact that he says that all of his attachments, his attachment to you, besides your attachment to you, are your emotions fading. And he's like, yeah, they're faint. I don't like that. I'm really sad. Mm -mm. And so meanwhile, you and Crowley are like trying to solve these riddles and everything. I love that he's like, he's like, why would Farad give me a riddle? Like, it's so funny. Far Farad leaving a riddle to, to Crowley to find everything. It's absolutely, it's very Willy Wonka. And I'm like, of course it is. Farad's just great. But so we find out that Crowley was a crusader fighting in a holy war for the sake of God who's now fallen so far as to become a vampire. It's kind of funny, huh? And I like that you so hung up on like, wait, you guys were all humans? Yeah, most vampires were humans at one point. Yep, figuring that out. And then he's like, well, he's like, why are you, why is a former human killing humans? And Crowley's like, are you serious? Look at history. Nothing kills more humans than humans. And I mean, Credo, Credo's proven his case in point. Credo has had no qualms about sacrificing all these humans for the sake of killing vampires. But he's like planning a coup d'etat against his own father. Mm -hmm. Planning to have a coup against his own dad. Like, it's just as bad. And... He's like, do, do you not get it? He's like, I killed scores upon scores of humans when I was still human. He's like, since becoming a vampire, it's not done nearly that much. So yeah, it's just showing that there's there's bad on all sides. I would argue with you with Mika. I feel bad because Mika says his emotions are fading, but I'm like, I there's still something there, right? Because Crowley and Farid, they're not like just empty husks. They have personality. They clearly care, and especially when Crowley says earlier that the whole thing about his family, I want to get to that because I absolutely love the panels of his his expressions. The way the mangaka just draws Crowley in this is so good. But yeah, I there's just something there, and I'm I hope yeah, when he says the remains of you and the other family members are kept in the cellar, you might go berserk if he sees them. Restrain him without killing him and make sure to protect while making sure to protect your friends. Yours truly, Farid Bathory. And his just face where he's like, friends? Who's friends? Like, it's just, it's so cute. Like, his expression, it's really, really cute. I'm like, oh my god. I, I just, I can't. Oh, I just love his expression. The way he drew him is so adorable. And he's like, oh, well, it's kind of tough being given friends for the first time in 800 years. Oh, like, I really liked his character after this. So yeah, so yeah, we've got all the friends that are in the test tubes. Mm-hmm. A little bit worried about that. What can we do? And then chapter 54, man, The Sinner's Christmas, where we have the whole thing about, I don't understand the bath. The bath scene is weird. The only good thing that came out of the bath scene with, with Shinoa and Mitsuba is that we find out that Farid had the had connections to demon armies and she's figured that out because he had the uniforms but i i don't like the fan so i'll be honest the fan service where she like slices open uh mitsuba's shirt to reveal that she's the g cup that's a little much i'm like i'm not into like the boob fan service stuff like that it's kind of creepy to me but if that's all we get in this series i'm fine it'll be fine but yeah so then Crowley has this conversation with, with Mika and he's like, you don't have to stare. He's like, there's some if you want it. And he asks whose blood it is. And he's like, I don't know. It tastes like a child's. Farid has a taste for young ones. And he says, it's strange. They're perfectly okay with roasting a cow. But when it comes to drinking the blood of their own, how come it engenders them such self-hate, such a feeling of sin? Hmm. And so he says, back when Farid first turned me, I used to have the same feeling about it. So he's like, I used to think that he's like, but then it's like no different, right? But they're not best friends or have a sense of, you know, community with that cow. It's different, right? And I think Mika is scared. He's like, I don't want to get to the point where I, I don't feel 
uncomfortable drinking the blood of my family. He's like, I don't want to lose that emotion. And Crowley, he's like, how long did it take for you to completely give, it, give up on being human? And Crowley doesn't answer him. We don't get Crowley's answer. I feel like Crowley's going to answer him at some point, but we don't get it in this. It's so frustrating. I'm like, damn it, no. And then there's the conversation where they try to weed out information from Gurren. And if you've read the first novel here, like, Knowing the past that these characters all have with Gurren, it's insane. But Shinya, I love Shinya and Gurren's relationship in the novel. I can't wait to talk about this series with y'all. I cannot wait. Um, but I've got three more novels to read, so not ready for it yet. But that image of her, we get all of them dead and Gurren crying over Shinya on Christmas and him going to save going to save Shinya and the others. Mm -hmm. But that imagery of Maharu as the demon, like sitting in his lap. Oh my God. That's so good because the, the relationship between Maharu and Gurren is so interesting. It's very intriguing. Um, it's a very intriguing relationship. Uh, there's a lot of complexity to it, so I can't wait to talk about that in the novel. But that imagery of her in his lap with her arms around him. And then the demon that's inside of Shinya can see her, which is interesting that they can see each other. And he says, you're no demon. So that's interesting. Uh-huh. That's curious, too. But, and the whole thing with the tiger, that's interesting. But her basically threatening Shinya's demon to not let him see, right? And then her, she can see the other vampire. She sees them burning. But Farid sees her. What the hell? How does he see her? Hmm. How, how is that? How is that indeed? So many questions. And that's what gets the fifth progenitor's attention. He's like, what is this? What is this? What's happening? You just moved, didn't you? What is this? Tell me. Tell me why you moved. And then we see that the fifth progenitor has some abilities. He like slices through the ocean. It's fun times. And then meanwhile, I like that Gurren like tries to run her over. It's interesting. And then we cut back to you offering to let Mika drink his blood. And so then the four Crowley, like, I just, I love that there was a trap that wouldn't let him see what was inside by himself. And so I thought when you said he wanted to hold um, Akane's jar, I thought that was insurance saying, I'm not going to go crazy because if I go crazy, I will destroy the jar and she will be turned to dust. Like she'll be no more. Like her remains will rot. He's like, so this is insurance. that I'm not going to go crazy. Let me hold the jar. I won't go crazy. I promise. He's like, I want to see my family. And Narumi's like, I know where you're coming from. So let's do this together. And then Mika's like, humans don't come back for the dead. And then you use like, I don't give a crap about the world. I just care about my family. I just want to save you. He sounds more like Maharu than he does with Gurren in that moment, which I've not read the other novels, so I can't say any more than that. But And so he's like, everyone here is my family and I want to keep you all safe. And Crowley's like, that's such greed. You sound like a demon. And he flashes back to when he was called a demon by, by his parents saying, you demon spawn, the world would be better off if you were dead. So he's like, I've been called that my whole life. He's like, I don't care what people call me. As long as I keep my family safe, I don't care. Hmm. And so they go down there and just, and you keeps it together. But like him holding, like Mika holding his hand. Like, I love that. And that expression by Mika where he's, where he's not sure. I wonder if Mika's trying to figure out if he still feels anything. But, but yeah, but Mika, he's not crying. And he says, I don't have the tears to cry anymore, but at least I have to, but I at least have to keep you safe. And so apparently there's someone in there that Crowley knows. So that's interesting. Like, why would Farid do that? Is it to manipulate Crowley as well? That's interesting. We don't get to see who it is, but that's curious. But they have all these books from the demon army that Shino is like, wow, great. What, why are these here? And then the, the, it ends with Gurren and them showing up, a haunted house. 
Oh my gosh. So Gurren and them have shown up. So it's all, the gang's all here. Everybody's gonna meet each other. Isn't that exciting? Ah! So, yeah, I just, I love the idea, the concept of talking about that humanity's not all sunshines and roses. Like they've, they have, humanity has caused mass genocide before and killed people and there's been hatred and greed and loss, but they're still caring and that need for family at the center of it that's kind of shown through all the darkness of humanity. There's still that light there. And I feel like even though we're seeing with the vampires and demons that they're married, there may still be a little light there. They're just not self-aware of it, but it seems like there might be something there. Crowley's tapped into something. Azure Amaru's tapped into something. So something may be there. We just don't know exactly what it is. And meanwhile, Shinya and crew only have a year left to live a second time before they go back. And if anybody tells, if they find out that they're back from the dead, they'll turn to dust. So, and they've shown up at this mansion where everybody knows they've been brought back from the dead. Like, I'm like, Farid, did you orchestrate all this, you troll? Probably. And we have Saito involved or Rigger Stafford, whatever you want to call him. Um, and then you have all these vampires collectively gathered. You have Coretto stand planning to, like, invade Shibuya. There's just a lot of stuff at work. I appreciate that the two volume covers for 13 and 14 were not spoilery. They just kind of showed uh, Maharu and Credo, but they didn't really give away anything. So yeah, so things are getting crazy. Hmm. And I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm really excited. I'm glad that they've not given too much of the backstory away because I want to keep reading the novel. And my dog now is going to freak out because I knocked. It's going to sound like a knock. Crap. <laughs> but in the meantime... Um, I'm curious to know your thoughts down below. Please do not spoil me on the novel. I'm going to be reading it these next couple weeks and tying it in with the manga as we go. But I'm curious to know your thoughts down below. So please no spoilers, but I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, maybe Whiteboard Coon will be back next week. I don't know. But I know I'll be back to talk more about Seraph of the End with manga volumes 15 and 16 next week. Bye.